It's my uh, pleasure today to welcome to our campus and introduce our guest speaker. I'm reminded that almost a year ago to the day was the summit of the president and the state's governors called together in the city of Charlottesville, Virginia to look at our nation at risk and to develop national goals for education. An important force behind that trend is our guest today, Laurel F. Cavazos. Secretary Cavazos was appointed by President Reagan in September of 1988 and later asked by President Bush to remain as Secretary of Education in the Bush administration. Dr. Cavazos is the son of a Texas ranch foreman, a former university professor, including a teaching post with the Medical College of Virginia as one of his starting appointments, served as a dean and a university president. He is the first Hispanic in the nation's history to serve in the president's cabinet. Now, a side note, I was talking with Mrs. Cavazos, and uh, you, may, you may know that the Cavazos family includes 10 children. Now, I've, I've uh, followed Dr. Cavazos' history as, a, as a, uh, an ideal that I might follow, someday perhaps <laughs> hoping to be the Secretary of Education. <laughs> so I studied carefully his career progression. And uh, you notice that he got his doctorate, and so I got mine, and he went on as a university professor, and I accepted an appointment at the University of Virginia, became a dean, so I, what else is there to do but became a dean, a college president, so I became a college president. But Mrs. Cavasso says that his major learning took place as a father with his 10 children. Well, Secretary Cavasso says, I have 14 children. I'm almost ready. <laughs> I'm sure Secretary Cavazos will tell you about the nation's educational goals and their importance to our future. But important as they may be, I don't think that he'll mention the goals that he announced before the Charlottesville summit, the goals that he announced in September of 1988 upon accepting the appointment as Secretary of Education. While he perhaps gives greater visibility to the nation's goals, I think it's important that you understand the person who stands in the position of Secretary of Education. Upon accepting his appointment, he pledged the following points. That every child have the chance to build self-esteem and positive goals in the earliest years of life. That all students learn to take responsibility for developing a commitment to learning that all individuals with disabilities be educated for maximum independence, that all parents become involved in their children's education, that all teachers be held accountable for their education programs and results, and finally, that the term dropout become obsolete. Dr. Cavazos is accompanied this afternoon by his wife, Peggy, and we're glad to have them both here. With that brief introduction of the man and his history, I'd like to present to you the Secretary of Education, Dr. Lawrence Cavazos. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. Thank you very, very much. That's very kind of you, Dr. Templin. Turn back before it's too late. <laughs> I spoke to a group of university presidents yesterday in Washington, D.C., and at the end of it, I said uh, how much I envied them. They, you go back to your campus, and I have to go across town to face another issue and a problem. What an opportunity to be here, my delight and my privilege. Peggy and I certainly look forward to visiting with you this afternoon. I want to thank Phi Theta Kappa for putting this on. How many Phi Theta Kappas do we have here? Raise your hand. What a wonderful, wonderful showing. I'm an honorary member of Phi Theta Kappa. I don't know that I've qualified academically. <laughs> <clears throat> and what happened when I was president of Texas Tech, for some reason it dawned on me that if we could go out and recruit a lot of Phi Theta Kappas, the entire grade point average and SAT and ACTs of the university would skyrocket, and that's exactly what happened. 
one time, at least when I was there, we had more Phi Theta Kappas at Texas Tech than any other university in the nation. And so therefore, I feel a close allegiance and it's such a wondrous thing because these are truly outstanding students. We're very proud of them. They also, I noted that they had a cumulative graduation grade point of 3.2. Uh, they stayed about 3.2, 3.4 as they graduated from our university. So treasure them, sir. They're really <laughs> tremendous as are all of our students and we appreciate that. I thought today I would speak in, about some of the issues that we're facing and looking at it from the community college uh, vantage and that role of community college and how I see it and then perhaps uh, I'll just talk a few minutes and then I will open it up to questions and listen to lectures and comments as well. <laughs> and, and I have been characterized as somewhat of a lightning rod and so therefore I stand tall and get hit quite often. But what I want to talk about today is the vitality of a community college as I see it. Because basically, first of all, I want to commend Thomas Nelson Community College, what you're doing. You're doing exactly what every community college and hopefully every university in the nation will be doing, and that is working with industry. I know that you've got an industry task force that your president was telling me about, and you're looking at the workforce for the, for the peninsula. Now, it's very interesting, as you struggle with that issue, and as you struggle to educate a lot of students as you move to, to giving access to a lot of people. You seek equity for them in the educational system. And you deal with perhaps some students that need a lot of support educationally. It's interesting to think about the Education Summit because as was pointed out by Dr. Templin, it was a year ago that this was called and it dealt, for the most part, with a variety of issues. It dealt with, clearly, education in general, but touched an awful lot on the workforce and being highly skilled in preparing that workforce. Talked about global competition as we gathered there, and it made the commitment, the governors and the president, that we would be second to none. Well, that's exactly the same motives, I'm sure, that you had as you started pulling together your industry task force. You wanted to talk about education, workforce, high skills, global competition, second to none. And so therefore it is fitting that we spend a moment talking about what happened at Charlottesville. It's of interest that that was only the third time in the history of the nation that a domestic summit was called. A domestic summit is the gathering of the governors of the states and the territories with the president uh, to discuss a vital issue. This time we also had the cabinet there. The first summit was Theodore Roosevelt, it dealt with the environment, and the second one was Franklin D. Roosevelt, of course that one dealt with the depression. But what a tremendous step it was, I told the president, I said, Mr. President, just by calling this summit, you have fe helped focus the nation's attention to the vital issue of education. Actually, we talked about that summit uh, when he was still president-elect. We came out of Charlottesville with three objectives. One, to establish national education goals. The second one was to provide more flexibility on the use of federal resources if the states would be more accountable. And the third one, was a commitment to restructure elementary and secondary education in the United States. Now, let me just touch on it very, very quickly in terms of the goals. I think it's important, and people have said, oh, those, those it's pie in the sky won't happen. But we're, we are really working toward these goals. And the goals are set for the year 2000, and here we are almost at the close of the first year. But listen to them by the year 2000 that every child starts school ready to learn. An enormous commitment on the part of the states that every child will be prepared. Here parental involvement is key. Parents as first teachers. Preparing that child ready to learn. I'm becoming more and more convinced that perhaps Head Start is already too late. 
that we really need to be educating these youngsters, and they're a year old, maybe younger, maybe a little bit older. By that time, a child has developed self-esteem and motivation, two keys to youngsters staying in school, staying off of drugs, and being successful. So what we have to do as a nation capitalize on that. My wife Peggy has told me, quit talking about daycare. So why don't you talk about learning care? Make every child for a moment a learning moment. Foreign language competency, how quickly one can move into that as a child. Or English, if you don't speak the other language. Hmm? So, but retain whatever the other language is. So therefore, early childhood. The second one, the second one is by the year 2000, that we increase the graduation rate from its current 71.1% from high school at the end of four years to 90%. Minnesota is already at 90%. I think Wisconsin is right behind it or perhaps maybe just ahead of it. But you must remember in that number, there are 600,000 to 700,000 youngsters that drop out of school every year. The third one deals with excellence. Excellence in mathematics and science and history and geography and English that our students really be prepared and we will measure those at 4th, 8th, and 12th grade levels. The fourth one, that by the year 2000, our students would be first in the world in math and science. Our last international comparison that we did, our students against their peers, we were last in mathematics and almost at the bottom of science against the 13 industrialized nations of the world. In fact, I'll have to share this little story with you. I was testifying before one of the science, before the Science and Technology mm -hmm. Subcommittee of the House. And you know, when you're testifying, you're out there all alone, this table, and uh, <clears throat> uh, they've been beating up on you for a couple hours. And, and one of them said, oh, Mr. Secretary, let's be realistic. How in the world do you ever expect, do you really think that by the year 2000, we'd be first in the world in math and science? And I thought to myself, uh, I'm under oath. Hmm? <laughs> Perjury is not my thing. And uh, then I remembered where I was, and I said, uh, yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> no, we will not achieve these goals if we continue our educational efforts in the direction that we're going in now. But yes, we will achieve them if America will marshal its human resources and make a major commitment to bringing about substantial change. Yes, we will reach those goals. The fifth one deals with adult literacy. That by the year 2000, every citizen be literate, capable of reading and writing, participating in government, being a member of the workforce. We estimate 27 million illiterates in the United States today, and another 40 million to 50 million who read at about the fourth grade level. They're basically out of the workforce in terms of technology. The sixth one, a condition that by the year 2000, every school in America be free of drugs and violence and have an ambience conducive to learning. Well, those are the goals. Those are the goals that I really believe we can reach, but we have a tremendous job to do. Basically, when you boil through those goals, is that all Americans participate fully in the political, the social, the economic life of this nation. What a wondrous undertaking for this nation in terms of education. We have never made that kind of a commitment. But one of the other points is that these goals are not focused at our best students. These goals are raising dramatically the achievement of every student, every student, that every student be prepared along that way. But to reach that, it's going to require everyone's participation. This is not a problem of the schools. It is all of our efforts together to solve that problem, and therefore it means the schools, the colleges, the universities, the parents, and the business community, America really doing its job. Now therefore, I really believe, that's why I wanted to be here today, I really believe that community colleges are ideal 
they are the ideal group to help us achieve those national goals. You provide universal access at very, very low cost. You know as well as I do that in some areas, probably 50% of the students that go on to higher education or post-secondary education go to a community college. Large numbers of minorities go to your colleges for the beginning of their education or perhaps in many cases, unfortunately, that is their, their completion level there. But it's really been interesting, the emergence of the community college system in the last two decades. Here, been a, a lot of things, and what has happened is you, you've caused almost an explosion in student participation. Your openness, understand you're open from 7 to 10 in the morning, in the, in the evening, uh, six days a week, terribly important, terribly important. I wish I could get the elementary, secondary schools to stay open equivalent amounts of time, too. Hmm? I couldn't get my faculty to teach more than from nine to three, four days a week when I at the university, but, but that's another aside. <laughs> but the, the point I'm making here is the flexibility that we see in community colleges should be also in the elementary, secondary schools. Think about it for a moment. We talked about early childhood education. Many people have to go to work. So schools are open at 7 in the morning, they can drop those children off, and they can start their education at that time. All day, of course, you need all kinds of restructuring. I'm blue skying now. All kinds of changes. But the school stays open beyond the traditional 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And youngsters that need help for homework have the teachers there or someone to help them. In the big city schools, they don't have to go home to some of the problems that they, the streets in the urban settings. Parents who need further education can come back in the evening to participate in that. So you see, you have the model here. Somehow, we need to move this model so that it fits that other model in elementary, secondary education. And there are, there, that's, we're talking about those kinds of things. And I think that certainly one can say, they can do it. Why can't a public school or a private school in another setting do it? It's been done by the community colleges already. The other thing you've done, you have been responsive to the individual needs and to society itself. And I think that that's an important element for any school system itself. You defined your role and scope very tightly. You know what you're going to do and what you hope to achieve to bring that around. You have dealt as a community college system with one of the most important elements we also face in America today, and that is the issue of diversity, of tremendous diversity in America today. For example, 30 percent of the students in American public schools today are either Hispanic or black. Unfortunately, only 10 percent of the teachers are minority teachers. So Anglo teachers have to deal then with another population they have to learn about that diversity. We spend a lot of time in universities and colleges talking about dealing with global diversity, important. Understanding global diversity, important. But institutions such as yours should help us understand ourselves and our own national diversity that is changing rapidly. Incredible rates of change. Already. Ten of the urban school districts, the largest urban school districts in America, are Hispanic. Seventy percent of them are, are Hispanic and black mm -hmm. mixture. So therefore, that's the direction that we're going into, and you have started to respond to that. You also respond to recent immigrants, moving them into the mainstream and the importance of education, to those who are disabled, to women who constitute more and more of the workforce. In fact, I shared a figure with your president at noon today. And I started thinking, think about the workforce, the kind of workforce that we will have, which is very important. It's clear that by the turn of the century, only 15% of the new entrants into the workforce of America will be Anglo males be women and minorities. And so therefore,
community colleges. What a marvelous opportunity, therefore, to, to come into this area. That linkage, therefore, between community, the college, the business, the partnerships, the students, you've been working on that and you need to continue to move that ahead. The community college paradigm has emerged in the last 50 years. Your model, commitment to democracy based on low cost and access, your comprehensive, lifelong learning in response to local needs. Now, the challenge. How are you going to put these strengths to work? Well, you certainly could help us by continuing to work very, very hard in the areas that you're doing. Adult literacy, I laid that out as the fifth national goal. Lifelong learning becomes an important part of the kinds of things that you can do here at this college. The second goal, increasing graduation rates, stemming dropouts, hmm? that's goal two. Great opportunity to keep youngsters in school. Great opportunity to bring them back into the system, either to complete a diploma or, or, or a GED or to get a degree. That would help us tremendously there. You know, the, the, the part that has been driven home to me time and time again, that when one person drops out, we all lose. We're poorer by that. And as I mentioned to you, when we think of 600,000 to 700,000 youngsters, and the loss of human potential is enormous. And this nation is letting it go. And so therefore, a community college that reaches out to bring those people back into the setting will play an important role in the future of this nation. The other part, contributing to increasing overall quality of education, becomes terribly important. But I see you in a different way, as I remark to your president. In essence, you're the broker. You're the broker. You're at the fulcrum in the community college system. You have that communication and contact with elementary secondary. The same time you have, it's going to be kind of an odd fulcrum, but that's all right, I'm going to get in trouble with my physics. Um, you also have, of course, that contact with, post, with uh, higher education, the business community. All of those become part of your contact, and so therefore, probably broker is a better word as you bring that about. Now, I would ask you, very specifically, in addition to working on helping us achieve those national goals, I would like to see community colleges participating more in the restructuring of elementary secondary education. Now, you can say, well, anyway, that's, not, that's not our business. Well, I submit that the quality of student that's out there today is coming down the line. And that is the quality that you will be taking in to this fine institution. So therefore, there is a role for post-secondary education, for community colleges, to participate in restructuring. Changes can only come about through the boards, of school, through school boards. It's very, very clear, therefore, that we need to participate in that. We have a lot of very bright, talented people here that can suggest the different kinds of strategies that need to come about. For example, a spirited discussion about academic choice, the selection of where your son or daughter will go to school without regard to district lines, school-based management strategies that we spend so much time talking about, giving teachers and principals more to say on a day-to-day -day basis as to what goes on in the school, participating with the parents in that discussion. Perhaps other strategies you might think about, early childhood education, some of the other things, curricular development, or we could go on and on. There are probably as many strategies as there are school boards out there. One of the other things you can do, your students in here, got some excellent students here, mentoring, Mentoring. If I ever think about teaching an adult how to read or teaching an older person how to read or teaching a younger person how to read or helping that child, maybe we'll get some more great teachers through that same system when they learn the joy of teaching and helping someone else 
community colleges can reach out there and encourage their faculty and their students to become involved as mentors. You have to work very, very hard on the issue of articulation. To me, it is, it, it, it is disturbing if you have a youngster coming through the system of a community college, then he or she goes on to higher education at a university, and you gotta go through another whole year because somehow that articulation did not work itself out. Right? Now, some states have really addressed that issue, others have not. I urge you, don't use up resources and talent trying to work those things out and guess. So therefore, community colleges can bring, you know, serve as the broker. Bring that university in here and say, now, what are you expecting? These, this is what our people can do. And let's work it out. Make them sign on the dotted line, too, on top of that. So therefore, articulation agreements. Help convince students to stay in school. And you can do that through programs that you know well, the two plus two tech prep kinds of programs that many community colleges do. The last two years in terms of rounding out the academic side, the next two years in really emphasizing the preparation through a vocation. That's available to it. That oftentimes keeps youngsters from dropping out of school. But I insist on one thing, that all of those students going on in vocational technical have a firm, solid academic background. People change careers four to five times in a lifetime. Some even become secretaries of education, Mr. President. And, and therefore, we need to prepare these youngsters for that. So they've got a solid background in math and science and English and history and geography, foreign languages. Then fine, teach them the other part that will follow. And so therefore, you can integrate academic and vocational instruction. You play a very, very important role, Thomas Nelson Community College. You can help us solve the deficits. The nation suffers from three deficits. Two of them you know quite well. The budget deficit, and I'm worrying about sequester on October the 1st already. We've been worrying about that for months. The second deficit is our trade deficit. And then the third one I've called America's education deficit. And America must recognize that all three of those deficits are linked. And we will not solve the budget and trade deficit until we solve that education deficit. It just is not going to happen. And so therefore, what can we do about it? We can come together and raise awareness of this nation to its deficits, its problems, the issues, and the opportunities. And I think that the first step, therefore, towards solving a problem is raising awareness. I think we started that in part through Charlottesville, but we have a long way to go. The second one is caring, really caring whether a student drops out or a young person does not complete an education or not educated to their fullest potential. I've talked to many students that were at risk, and you can predict them, that were at risk of dropping out. And when you ask them, well, why didn't you? Why didn't you drop out? And they'll say, somebody cared about me, my parents, my teacher, friend. Caring is a vital, important issue. Students caring about each other is vital. Third one. As a nation, let's raise expectations of every student as to what they can really achieve. Raising expectations. I talked to so many students and they'll say, I said, why'd you drop out? Oh, they said, I couldn't do it. They said, I'd never get out of high school. I, there's no future for me. Well, we raise expectations of every youngster in America today that yes, they can achieve. We raise expectations of adults that yes, you can learn to read. Yes, you can be a member, a literate member of this community. And the fourth one, working together. Working together. That is vital. You're doing that here. And so therefore you have the direction, the beginning. You are, as I've mentioned, perhaps broker or fulcrum point. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.
you, you thank our few questions. Sure. Uh, we'll be happy to entertain a few questions at this point. Uh, we're running close on time, so probably only three. Yes, yes sir. Secretary, uh, you mentioned academic choice. Uh, I'm aware that Minnesota has mandated uh, so-called parent choice and uh, entered that program with uh, fairly high expectations, I suppose. Uh, I also understand that only one half of one percent of the students eligible for making the, 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 the choice elected to do so. I can understand why high school students rarely would do so because their roots are very deep. Sure. In your opinion, since the likelihood of of that possibility will expand for debate in a number of states. Where, what do you personally see from your vantage point the advantage to be in, uh, in uh, academic choice? All right, let me touch on that a little bit. Since uh, Minnesota has gone statewide, and you're absolutely correct in your figures, we're doing a five-year evaluation on that, by the way. But since then, there have been about seven other states that have taken on choice in expanded choice, educational choice opportunities, and we see another three or four coming down the road very rapidly. Basically, what the issue is here is an opportunity for a parent, for the parents to work with the schools so that the schools will fit the needs of the, of the child. Now, I always couple something else. Academic choice is not enough for me. As, as one other person said, choice between two bad schools is no choice at all. Huh? Well, what I'd rather see is school-based management. That empowers the teachers and the principals working with the parents to create the kind of school environment that they want to do. And therefore, you get differences between schools. Sure, they're all going to teach English and math and the other, but there'll be differences between them. And therefore, it is the selection of those schools that will permit that. Now, that puts in another factor into it. How about a little bit of competitiveness? Now, that scares a lot of people, a little competitiveness between schools. And so, therefore, once you have, have uh, that element into it of competitiveness, if you start losing a lot of your students, the message gets across very quick to the state school board, or to the local school board for that matter. Huh? Now there's such things as being academically bankrupt. And states have come in and New Jersey's gone in and taken over because they were unable to provide the quality education. Competitiveness. The main thing it does, choice to me empowers parents and students. Ac uh, academic choice empowers parents and students. School-based management really empowers teachers and principals, gives them that independence, but they also make a commit commitment. They commit to excellence. So therefore, I think you're going to see a lot of discussion to this issue. We have a lot of evaluations on, uh, let me say school's still out on that, the, these things. But I really believe the main thing is people coming together as neighbors to talk about the issue. That's, that's a major step. In the past, we really have not done even that much. We'll take another question. Yes, back there. Mr. Secretary, your position, you got a lot of information, a lot of data about education in other nations. And you mentioned that we are at the bottom in mathematics. Uh, do the other nations spend as much money as the United States in education in mm -hmm. the budget? And sure. what are you doing to get as much of Hong Kong or Japan? Right, let me respond to that. We spend more per student than any other nation in the world except Switzerland. We can't compete. Now, people have said to me, well, I know how to solve the education deficit. Let's put more money into the system. Well, let's look at that data. This year, we estimate that we will, as a nation, we we'll spend $231 billion on elementary and secondary education. That's the total. We spend more of our gross national product on education than we do on defense. And Basically, what I'm getting at here, from 1980-81 until last year, we had an increase of 36% expenditure for education adjusted for inflation. It's an enormous amount of dollars that have gone into well over $40 billion uh, in increase adjusted for inflation. Yet during that decade, we continued to see declining SATs, ACTs can't compete, uh, people dropping out, not being competitive in the workforce, and these other kinds of things. I point out that American businesses spent $25 billion on remedial education last year alone. So that what I'm saying, and what others are saying, is that we need to change the system, restructure it, bring about that change. Sure, there are some school districts, I know, that need money, need additional funding, need resources, 
facilities, but I'm looking at it from a, from a national level. So the answer is not an easy one. Let's just increase the number of school days, for example. That's the other one I get. Why don't we go to Japan's 220? Then we'll be, I say, how do you use the time you have right now, your 180 that you have now? How do you use that? And then what would you do with the new time? May I take one more question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, uh, the title before you had the position was HEW, mm -hmm. Health, Education, and Welfare. Yes, sir. Many of the problems that you mentioned seem to be one of the poor, dropout rate among the poor, um, adult literacy among the poor. Do you feel that part of the answer to education isn't just the amount of money put into education, but the amount of money that goes to solve some of the problems of the poor, so that when the child goes home, that there's an environment whereby they can have a light to rebuy, a home to go to, and possibly a meal to eat. Mm -hmm. There's no question about it that, that the entire social fabric of the nation has changed during the last two decades. The kinds of things you're talking about are happening. Schools are asking now to take on more and more responsibility in things that we never dreamed of in the past. Uh, that are not strictly education as such. And that's why it is so important, therefore, to bring the parents into this, these discussions as best you can. Now, let me point out, I really believe, as I've, I've said many times, that if, if I had to predict just two things, to guarantee success in education, the first one would be parental involvement. You just must have that, as I've said. But the other one is language competency, that's learning uh, English as rapidly as one can and retaining the other language. And so therefore we have to find ways of reaching out to them. We've got to get a message out across to them. And I, I uh, we oftentimes, I'm going, to, I'm going to close with this little model. Uh, we oftentimes talk about parents coming into the schools and participating and that's great and hope we can do it. But I, I, I give my wife credit for this one. She said, well let me give you a good example of parental involvement. A mother or father awakening a son or a daughter and saying something important is about to happen. It's time to go to school. You need to get up now. Your clothes are washed and your breakfast is ready. That's parental involvement too. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.